For me personally, I multiplied 24 months worth of living expenses and converted them 80% to gold, 20% to silver. Welcome to Coffee with Lynette. I'm your host, Lynette Zhang, and with me today is a returning guest, Lior Gans, my favorite millennial. Uh, he is co-creator of the Wealth Research Group, and we've put all the links below for you. He's a popular speaker, he's an author, but he's also a global entrepreneur. And so in light of what's happening on a global basis with the trade wars, he's absolutely a perfect guest to have on and let me welcome you. Thank you so much for coming back, Lior. We're so happy to have you here today. I'm always excited to be here. <laughs> yes. Well, let's start with, uh, let's just jump right in and talk about the escalating trade wars and what you really see, what the implication of that would be on global debt. There's a few things to consider between um, what's going on with China and the U.S. Um, yes. Well, let's go back to the basics. So, so the U.S. is is the world's largest economy, and it has uh, a lot of interests it needs to protect. Um, and China is the rising power in, in the world, and this is very much akin akin to what happened um, in the 20s and 30s in in Europe, where England, France uh, won the First World War, uh, Germany was uh, the loser. Uh, obviously, the U.S. was part of the winning side, and then. Uh, Germany was rising in the 30s. Um, we had many of the similarities that are going on right now in terms of a rising power, a, a power that is existing, and how they tackle um, th this this uh, battle between them. It can, it can end with, with uh, tariffs and, and um, negotiations, diplomacy. It can end worse, like, like, we've, saw, like we've seen before. So... Um, right. Obviously, uh, I don't like the word trade wars because it's it's not a war yet, right? And and we shouldn't um, we shouldn't put these uh, very negative words. For now, it's a it's a trading a renegotiation of what's going on. Um, I think on the U.S. side, uh, what what the presidency, what the administration is looking to achieve, is a situation where uh, globalism does not create a problem for an increasing amount of Americans. So um, <clears throat> you can think of it this way. In, in a world where all the nations are not coordinated in trying to create a win-win economy globally, you have a situation where it, it, there's competition between nations. So in other words, if all the nations of the world would say, hey, no nuclear weapons anymore, it would be an incredible world, but enough that one country has nuclear weapons and now other countries must protect themselves by having nuclear weapons as well. So it's either that or that. Now, we don't live in a world where all the countries are looking to create a win-win situation um, yet. So every time that one country has some sort of advantage, the other country needs to have that as well. Now, in the world that we live in, uh, corporations in America have since the 80s or even the, uh, as early as the 70s have uh, seen that uh, they can compete better on the global um, economy if they outsource some of the work that's being done by U.S. labor for 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, 20, 30 bucks an hour and move it to countries where there's right. less regulations, less of everything, and you can find uh, capable people for 2, 3, 4, 10, 20 dollars a day instead of an hour, which obviously in a market economy, in a market system, all day long, if you put, I don't care where you live in, in the U.S. and how patriotic you are, if you put on the right side of the road a gas station that says American-owned, we only employ American good old people from the U.S., five bucks per liter, and on the left side, it will be a Chinese-owned, everything in China, in, in Chinese, and it will say we only employ people that came into this country, blah, 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 illegally even. It's three bucks for the leader. The three bucks will be packed while the five bucks will go out of business. Now, the reason is we live in a market system. So profits are the main driver. Now, we could be idealistic and you know talk all day long about 
um, how this uh, this is not me. You're not talking personally about me, etc. Right. The society we live in dr goes on profit, and therefore, if machines, if automation, if robotics, if other countries, if anything can drive profits up, it's going to get done. Because otherwise, and this is you know we need to remember that if it's not done, then the shareholders of that company will start seeing falling profits, less competitive advantage, and sooner or later, there's not going to be any wage paid by that management company because the company will go bust. So, I, well, you know, it's, it's important to understand that we're dealing with philosophical questions uh, as an economy, as a society, and we're dealing with financial questions. So, the trade um, renegotiation with China is trying to create a situation where less Americans get displaced, where less Americans fall to the fringes of society and become um, non-productive, become um, not motivated, and feel like they're stuck and they have no opportunities, which is very uh, bad for a um, for a rich economy and for a, a, a democratic economy. You can't have a rich um, economy where the wealth gap is, in, is huge. Because it creates a situation where the people that are uh, living on minimum wage or less are prone to um, to go into crime or to to be very desperate and, and social unrest. But that's exactly what's happened <clears throat> with globalization and that division, uh, that wealth gap between exactly. the haves and the have-nots, which is why we've seen Correct. a lot of rise of social power or you know socialism. Well, not really. We should. Social. We should. We should. We should call it populism. 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 Thank you. That's the right word. You can have populism, and populism essentially means that a larger segment of the population believes that capital capitalism mm -hmm. doesn't work for them. Now, the last huge event, the last moment where uh, the United States took either a left or a right was in 2008. In 2008, the monetary policies and the fiscal policies that were chosen, that were prioritized uh, by the government and the central banks um, was to save and, and help, first of all, financial institutions over distressed homeowners. Right. Uh, in other words, when they when they make that decision, uh, for good or for bad, right, they they create a, a certain, a certain uh, butterfly effect, a, a certain right. path that the, the United States went through. Now, what was that effect? That effect helped uh, financial institutions to uh, become very capitalized real quick. It caused asset prices in the stock market to recover really quickly. Or and inflate. Cost, that's where the hyperinflation went. All that sure, the, QE money so, printing. Yes. So credit, uh, which was basically essentially what the, the central banks create, credit, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and obviously tart money. So when you create those situations, they 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 get funneled into certain factions of society and certain right. factions of uh, uh, of equities. And what it did is create a situation where by 2011, most uh, millionaires and multimillionaires and even very uh, you know the upper middle class already saw the pre prices uh, the pre crisis wealth for them come back to those levels and mm -hmm. by 20 uh, what 2018 they're much richer than 10 years ago because basically credit was assigned to them so they can use it and deploy it better uh, exactly. the same thing was cannot be said for the general population and therefore you see that in the US when you try to um, project national averages like say hey the unemployment is four percent you know some people say oh, hold on you're not talking about me. I live in America, but I have to work three or four jobs here, and I can't make a living, and etc. So, the national averages do not mean anything anymore. It's right. as if there's there's one cycle here, which this cycle is for people that have assets and have businesses and have exposure to globalism, and they can enjoy uh, a certain type of uh, of lifestyle. And their kids have better education, better opportunities. They they can afford to um, uh, to make more mistakes. They can afford to um, look for better job opportunities. And you have here a bigger group right. 
that is inside of a cycle where there is no opportunity because they can't access those jobs. And, right. and so you're faced as a society with a, with a situation of how to fix this. Um, well, and therefore, I, you can, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to mean to interrupt, but there was a recent uh, Pew study that was done that said six out of 10 people say that they have not recovered from the crisis that happened in 2008. And that supports what you're talking about. Sure, it makes sense because uh, all, first of all, many people are retired. So for them, um, oh. Sort of a recovery is 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 um, uh, is not even possible in the way we um, we live in today's world, right? So so social it's not like social security is going to double or or med, right. you know what they live off of the the passive income or subsidies etc are not being affected. If they have a large portfolio and they didn't sell during the panic, then yes they they could recover. But uh, if they panicked out and and they sit on cash for ten years now then they haven't enjoyed even the part that they could have enjoyed. Um, so, yes, yeah, so uh, I'm assuming a large percent of retirees well, have not recovered. And then on the flip side, most Americans live uh, in, in a reality where their jobs are not high-paying jobs. So right. they haven't recovered as well. Now, in, in the last uh, about year, year and a half, so uh, approximately when uh, President Trump was elected, uh, We've seen, um, one, we've seen a greater sense that, hey, there's a great time to hire, a great time to, uh, because Trump is, is uh, deregulating, create a, a better business environment, uh, lowering taxes, etc. So this is going on, and people, uh, in general, people are feeling great. Sure, there's factions of society that still are, are not understanding where the, where the recovery is. And to them, uh, whatever happens in other states and other cities and other neighborhoods does not touch them. Uh, but overall, um, the the recovery has um, reached the extent of what it will do. And this is a very problematic situation because you have a big part of society that hasn't felt the recovery. So what's going to happen when there's a downturn, when there's a slowdown, when companies um, can't become more efficient um, any longer by running more machines or you know running production uh, better the only way that they can cut the fat and get the better margins is by laying off some people or by closing down some some parts so the next downturn is going to create a situation where um, the banks and the politicians will not want to seem like they're colluding again they cannot politically afford For, to look right. like they're allies again so they're not going to trust each other and so this is what I fear will happen in, in the United States. You're going to have such a division and such uh, con you know, um, conflicting interests and so much distrust, the next downturn, that it's going to be very hard to get things done. And that could prolong uh, uh, an otherwise fixable problem or, or, or an, um, an easily fixable problem. So what I think will happen on that... Um, sure. It, 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 I'm assuming uh, I, uh, I rattled your cage and you want to ask me something. <laughs> you did rattle it a little bit. Because what, what are you referring to an easily fixable problem? Exactly what problem are you referring to that would be so, easily fixable? So, sure. So, so there's there's two major problems, right? One okay. is like a 21.5 a $20 trillion uh, uh, federal deficit, federal uh, debt with a $1 trillion a year de uh, federal deficit right now. And all it has to do with the fact that how, how long will the US uh, dollar will be the, the reserve currency of the world? Um, how long could the federal government keep paying uh, social security, defense, uh, interest payments, the the, earn, uh, the, the, uh, the income security uh, in, in Medicare, et cetera? Um, and then how long will it keep paying these very low, artificially low interest rates on, on debt that could not be repaid. It could be served. The interest rate might be serviced, but obviously they're not closing down the principal, the debt. And then the flip side is you got, you know, the private sector, um, uh, homeowner debt, uh, credit card debt, uh, student debt, which is uh, which is quasi-governmental because they they, they uh, guarantee all the debt. Right. Um, so you have two problems, and obviously here I put I put um, uh, a falling stock market. Um, a bad jobs market, et cetera. So, okay, so 
Let, let's just kind of break that down a little bit for for <clears throat> our listeners because yeah. we're hearing all of that. But how would that be fixable in light of where we are right now? In in light of the tools that the central banks have to work with and where we are in the debt cycle right now? Great question. Now, it, it all comes back to how um, unified we can be and how um, uh, or how unified Americans can be with each other, how much they're willing to work together, how much people are willing to make sacrifices to, oblig to the unfunded liabilities that they were promised, how much uh, do shareholders and, and um, corporations willing to take a hit. It, it's, a, it's a huge problem, right? Because nobody wants to, to lose out. And, and in the end, in well, the end, yeah, it... it yeah, go ahead. I mean, I mean, typically the way that that central banks and governments have <clears throat> solved these problems is not in the change of behavior, but just in taking on more debt. And when I look at those charts and graphs, we can see in 2008, there was a very clear pattern shift and that debt pattern, I'm not saying they haven't escalated more debt, but that debt pattern and that debt cycle has really been breaking down ever since. Because, and the other piece that I kind of want to throw out there to talk about is we are in a consumer, and, and not just in the US, but China right now is transitioning into a consumer driven economy. The US <clears throat> is primarily a consumer driven economy and what the consumers aren't spending the government is spending and we as taxpayers are responsible for that spending. So if you have the corporations and they are, their profits are going through the roof in terms of dollars, right? But the individuals, that loss of the middle class that we need to, you know, talk about, how how long, how can they fix that problem with the old tools that they used, which is just more credit? I mean, at some point, don't they have to pay this back? All of it? Sure. So, so or default. The the so you you're talking about um, two very important subjects which need to be addressed separately. So, um, there's two sorts of policies that they that uh, debt cycles or or you know because uh, these are cycles. So debt cycles or, or credit cycles, right? So one side is, is creating credit, the other side is taking on the debt. Right. Um, and, and so in terms of mon monetary policy, the central bank uh, is going to get marginalized the next uh, um, recession because its, its toolkit has been uh, diminished. Uh, you can try to slash interest rates, but they're, they're very low. So um, the effect Negative would have rates. is... Uh, the effect it would have is is minimal. Um, creating currency would be almost impossible uh, politically, and it 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 can have um, very problematic effects this time, as to uh, how much inflation it can it can cause. So when a country um, has the ability and the privilege to create credit dominated denominated in, in its own currency, usually it faces problems of deflation and not inflation. Um, but when this certain country, the U.S., goes into a situation where other countries, other the foreign creditors, are not willing to lend it uh, money at, at lower interest rates, and there's a problem with how many um, uh, how many treasury bonds can be issued at low interest rates, you can accommodate that by printing credit on your own. But that situation creates inflation and not deflation, even though it's in, with your own currency. So they're going to try and obviously avoid that kind of situation because but, in a but country they, but where they've been But they've been doing it <clears throat> since the end of 2002. In this country, that was the first time it was, I think it was December 18th of 2002. I could be off by a few days, but it was December of, uh, of 2002 where we no longer, the U.S. no longer attracted enough buyers of our treasuries and the Federal Reserve started buying them back then. So we're kind of late in that cycle. And, and from what I'm seeing, all of the governments and all of the central banks are working in that regard now because there's just so much <clears throat> credit 
and so much debt that, you know, they have to do that. And Lynette, uh, and right now what they're doing is they're shrinking their balance sheet. So uh, it's creating <laughs> a situation. Right. Well, it, but it but it keeps on going, right? So, so the central banks are not buyers of bonds anymore. And this is what I'm talking about. They will have a situation, the federal government, well, they will need to issue more debt to pay for ever growing obligations. Right. But there will not be sufficient buyers on the other hand. And if you want to accommodate that by simply printing currency, that is risky uh, because that is not a QE pro. That is not purchasing bonds by the Fed by giving uh, by creating currency for that purpose. So they're not going to buy bonds. They're going to straight create currency. If they do that, you run the risk of inflation. Now, the U.S. hasn't faced um, double digit inflation like other countries uh, thus far. But if it happens in a country as divided and as problematic as the U.S. is at the moment, it's a huge risk. Um, and therefore, I think that the fiscal policy, the government, will be more of the main player in how to, um, uh, in how to, to solve, uh, but not to solve, I'm not talking about how to solve the, the national debt. I'm talking how to solve the, the, the current recession and, and get us over the hurdle so we can move on to the next cycle, et cetera. So when I'm, talk when I'm talking about that, it, what I'm saying is the fiscal policy will depend on who wins. If there, if uh, Democrats win the election, we're probably going to see the country move towards infrastructure programs where the government will create more initiatives for people to get into jobs and basically create a situation where there's going to be job demand out there by the government. So people are going to get uh, put to work. Wages are going to go up because there's a, there's a new player fighting for, uh, you know, for employees with the private sector. So you're going to see uh, uh, well, wages going up. Obviously, we're not talking 10, 20, 30 percent. We're talking 2 or 3 percent. But still, you're going to see a more robust job market at the expense of the taxpayers, which are going to have to pay for uh, these uh, public initiative jobs and public in initiatives. If the Republicans win again, then obviously it's going to go more towards um, another reform to, to the taxes. Um, uh, if Trump is elected, again, it's going to be how to uh, uh, fight with China even further on tr in terms of <clears throat> trying to create a sort of a, uh, a, a the uh, globalized world. There, there is no easy solution and there is no easy is no solution, fix. Yeah. So these are, these are huge problems that I don't wish on anyone to be the one that has to wake up in the morning with the burden of thinking how to solve them. Uh, but we are well, in living in a world where the initial problem started all the way back right in 1971. So we are we are inheriting a problem every day that started uh, back then. So there there's really no easy fix. And uh, it's important to, to make sure that as a First of all, as a, as a citizen, as, as an investor, as a saver, as a, as a career person, you kind of uh, think about how you want to live in this type of environment because you need to think, first of all, what's my main career going to be because that's my active income? What's going to be my portfolio strategy because that's going to be my passive income? And should I have a parachute, a plan B in case the, the system itself runs into trouble? Because <clears throat> what's going to happen is the next president, um, whether it be Trump again or, or a different president, um, is going to have to tackle for the first time unfunded liabilities. Right. So uh, it's going to either he's going to either create a situation where there's more stipulation. Uh, in other words, if you want your social securities check, show us a pay stub. Uh, for example, I'm um, just throw an idea out there. There's already. Um, uh, le already been legislated in Kentucky. So in Kentucky, if you want to receive your Social Security, you got to be working. Um, you can postpone the retirement age. Uh, you can slash uh, the amount that people will get because this is not set in stone. Obviously, this is all fluid, well, right? It's, it's right, and it's and it actually <clears throat> isn't a legal obligation of the government. However, um, you know, a p part of you know, when, when I'm hearing this, it's almost like you still uh, put value 
inside of these currencies that virtually have, the only reason why they have any value at all is because we're still willing to work for them and value our labor in terms of them. But I, I would- and, and, that, and that's exactly uh, what I said. It, it's important to think about yourself inside of this complex world where you might be thinking, hey, I can't believe people ascribe value to a, to a fiat currency. I wish everyone were like me and understanding that, hey, we should uh, be using a, a gold uh, standard or actually physical gold or physical, we should have a, a different environment. But on the flip side, um, it, it's important to understand that we do live inside of that world. So how do we balance, mitigate both of these ideas and therefore, uh, and, and obviously, look, even if you even if you shout from the mountaintops that the Federal Reserve is a quasi private art corporation and, and you right. tell people everything, it may not have the effect that you think it will have. So it, it's important to balance um, our aspirations, our, our wishes for the rest of society to kind of see what we see. Um, with reality. That's so proper diversification is really what you're talking about. <clears throat> we're, we're in a complex world, right? So, so as long as the economy is not hitting these very unique situation of hyperinflation or uh, large inflation, which are uh, not the norm, we don't live in them every day, but they can happen, sure. So you got to take care of your career regardless, regardless, even in hyperinflation, once that's solved, you know, career is career. Then as an investor, you need to think about how to beat inflation. Now, when you think about it uh, as an investor, you need to think what uh, sort of uh, investment um, vehicles beat inflation, beat higher rates of inflation, you know, beats deflation, et cetera. So this is something you need to tackle. I mean, I, you know, I mean, sure. And, and it's, uh, I suppose yeah. this let time me, could let, be different. Let, but... let, me get, let me get to hyperinflation okay. uh, uh, All right. in a second. So this is how you deal with inflation as as part of the system, right? Because inflation is part of the system. Um, and then as a savior, as a saver, not as an investor, not as a career person, the money you sa your savings, your 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 nest egg. Uh, what do you do with that? How do you manage that in light of um, risks and threats? And then you have three different heads hats that you wear: the investor hat, the saver hat, and the career hat. And you need to really think of, in all three: what do I do? in order to both advance as quickly as possible and do it in a way that I have uh, parachutes and plan Bs. So um, when when you do all that, there is very uh, a very legitimate part um, that you need to think about in terms of should I have a precious metals position, uh, physical precious, metal, pre mm -hmm. precious metals position. And the answer is an overwhelmingly yes, even if you're the world's best investor, Warren Buffett, and uh, you take uh, the fact that the Berkshire Hathaway's money owned by the shareholders, which Warren is one of the shareholders, he just happens to be the biggest one, but they, the company has over a million shareholders. Since 1971, if he would have stopped talking about the fact that America is the, the greatest thing since, you know, since Jesus, and started saying, okay, let me take this 20% of the cash the company has uh, that he always keeps around, 20% cash or more. Let me take half of it or 10% of it. Let me put that cash instead of in short-term treasuries, which is usually what he does, let me put it in gold or silver. Since 1971, that bet would have been much better. In other words, uh, there's a room in your portfolio as an investor, but also as a saver to put some of your fiat currency into into precious metals uh, in physical form. Now that doesn't mean that it's it's the uh, the fastest growing segment of your portfolio because gold that's and silver do that's not. About. Exactly. But if you want to protect some of your cash that's idle cash, it's a great um, strategy. And therefore, one aspect of this is. Okay, I have savings. What do I do with them? Should I hold them in their current form, in the in their fiat form, in their USD form? 
Should I convert some to other currencies that are uh, in, in commodity-based economies like Australia or Canada or, um, uh, you know, or Russia? Or should, I put them in, or, should, or should I put them in, in, in precious metals in physical form? Should it be gold? Should it be silver, platinum, palladium? What, what should it be? So uh, can, these can are we questions kinda, that, Can we kind of go back to you talking about currencies that are, well, I, did you say commodity-backed? Uh, yes. So, so resource-rich economies. Oh, resource-rich economies. Okay, like Australia yeah. is actually exactly. A, a yeah, the good. Is not the 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 currency is not uh, uh, convertible into commodities. The economy itself, which derives its tax revenue from uh, the citizens, is primarily based on some sort of a resource uh, economy. So that's what I mean. And their economy is very tied into China's economy. I believe that China buys more uh, exports from Australia than yeah. any other country does. Yes, yeah. So so this is something you need to think about. Now, um, for myself, I have um, several parachutes, right? So one of those parachutes is uh, what's called the start over fund. So the start over fund is before I ever uh, built a portfolio, I have about 12 months worth of uh, living expenses in fiat currency in physical and like ca like physical cash actually um, d denominated in several of the world's biggest and most stable currencies. So you, you have a you have a roll, you have actually a bundle of, of Swiss francs, you have a bundle of you know of the big currencies, etc. And you have that around. So that's one thing. Uh, and, and, you, and obviously, you know, you, you wish you'd never have to open that duffel bag, right? But it's there. Um, then you have physical precious metals. It depends on you how much you want to convert from fiat to precious metals. For for me personally, I multiplied 24 months worth of living expenses and converted them 80% to gold, 20% to silver. And th this is the extent of my um, precious metals in physical form position. I, obviously, if my living expenses go up, I, I moderate that. Um, accordingly. Um, and that's that. So those are two parachutes. Third, I have offshore real estate, which is just s simply um, properties owned not in my native country, not in the country that I'm a citizen at or a resident at. Uh, and then I have a second citizenry. So I have more than one passport. So one, more than one country welcomes me in case of a problem. Um, so that's another parachute. Um, and I have a whole life uh, insurance. So people can, can Google and see what that is. But so, yeah, that's all I wanted to, to kind of um, highlight is that we live in a world where uh, our fiat currency is, uh, in, uh, in essence, unfair. So, yes. and I think this kind of ends um, what I love to, what I want to share is I think people need to have a partner. Uh, no one ever becomes rich on their own. It doesn't matter yes. how the media portrays um, or uh, put people on a pedestal or, or uh, when you read autobiographies. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter which person um, you look at from Da Vinci, a painter, a sculptor, right. to Beyonce, a singer. So, so these professions, whether it's, it's, it's about you or a tennis player um, or uh, Bill Gates, uh, Warren Buffett, etc., they all have at least one person who is sort of a, a an ally, a more right. than important. And I think if people can uh, go out there and, and this do this first, find a partner, you'll have um, you'll have success in life far more than you would if you try to be a lone wolf. Um, and, and that is key. Uh, we talked about parachutes, Plan Bs, right? The duffel bag with firm currency, the personal friends are uh, community are as important yes right. are as important community. as these things and um uh, i think that's uh key to remember as well oh i <clears throat> leo this has been a great conversation and i really appreciate your time and i know you're you know you're probably on you are on a totally different time zone so T we've been at it for well, quite well, some time it, now so I, yeah. i'm going to we'll close out here but is there anything are those else that, yeah? Are those, are those tissues because I, I, I make you emotional? <laughs> yes, you do make me emotional. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but that's okay. I mean, that's what I like. I mean, I love it when we have discussion. We don't have to agree on everything. The beauty for those that are watching are the different perspectives. You know, because every yeah. at the end of the day, everybody has to choose for themselves what feels yeah. right to you. And sure. that's the way you have to move forward. I mean, I can't tell you what to do. I can tell you what I'm doing for me, what I'm mm -hmm. comfortable with, you know, and I'm in agreement with you and community is huge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I also think that whether we go through a reset or whether this phase is prolonged, everybody needs the same thing. Food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, as well as that community. So I'd like to thank you for this community conversation today. And uh, I have an extra bedroom. If there's a reset, we have an extra bedroom right here. I'm coming. I'm coming over. <laughs> I have lots of space too, and I've been working on it for a long time. So thank you so much, Lior. Please be thank safe. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. We'll have you again. You take care. Everybody out there, bye-bye.